we return now to uh, another somber theme, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, can I just uh, remind you that in September 2006, the famous British artist Banksy ex exhibited a picture of an elephant in a room in barely legal exhibition in Los Angeles. Uh, the theme of that exhibition was global poverty. Uh, but today's elephant is global population. And our next speaker is Professor Roger Short from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Roger's a reproductive biologist who has worked in Bristol and Cambridge and Edinburgh, where he was the foundation director of the new Medical Research Council unit of reproductive biology. He now works in Melbourne, Australia, where he has a personal chair in Monash University. He's deeply involved in the growing problem of HIV AIDS and with Malcolm Potts at Berkeley published a recent book entitled Ever Since Adam and Eve, The Evolution of Human Sexuality, a Darwinian view of human reproduction. Uh, please welcome Roger who will speak to us on the topic Populate and Perish. Well, thank you for that introduction, Brian. Um, I now know what it means to be caught short. <laughs> I'd never understood before. And it's very kind of you to uh, invite me to, to stand in for uh, somebody who I'm sure would be a better speaker than me. But what an exciting meeting. I feel like a sort of internally a round of applause. Um, and the first two speakers we've had have really set the theme for what I want to talk about, uh, which is uh, a plague of people. And my first PowerPoint is you, the audience. I want to use you for a second. Could I have hands up those who have more than one brother or sister? Just look around the room. Wow. I think I could almost sit down. <laughs> uh, my point is made. But what brought us here, all of us, was that we have been inspired in one way or another by Darwin. So what inspired Darwin? Well, um, we have a very interesting account by Darwin himself um, in his um, memoirs, saying that when he got back from the Beagle, uh, the Beagle voyage, in October 1838, uh, he says this in his autobiography. So October 1838. I happened to read for amusement Malthus on population, and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of the habits of animals and plants, it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. The result of this would be the formation of a new species, here, then, I had at last got a theory by which to work. I don't know if any of you have gone into the dining hall in Jesus College this week, where you will see a full portrait of Thomas Robert Malthus, who in 1798 wrote that amazing, astounding, anonymous essay on the principle of population. Uh, Malthus um, had a cleft palate. He wanted to go into the church, but he couldn't preach because no one could hear what he was saying. So he couldn't go into the church. He was second wrangler as a student, so a brilliant mathematician, and produced uh, his uh, essay on the principle of population, and just to briefly, uh, in a sentence, say, the power of population 
is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. This implies a strong and constantly operating check on population from the difficulty of subsistence. This difficulty must fall somewhere and must necessarily be severely felt by a large portion of mankind. And he was ridiculed for that. But Darwin found it inspiring because he'd put his finger on the spot. <laughs> In um, March this year, the United Nations um, uh, Population Division issued its uh, latest uh, predictions for uh, future population growth. And I'd like to just run through them very quickly. Um, they are really a reiteration what, uh, with what Lord Rees has told us. So on the 1st of July, a week ago, we reached 6.8 billion. When Malthus was alive, there was one billion. And that was also true of the, of the early years of uh, Darwin's life, just, just over one billion. And now we're 6.8. Wow! But what's worse is the latest UN projections say that by 2050, we're going to be probably 9.1 billion, although the range is rather wide. If we do something to redress the problem of population overgrowth now, we could contain future growth, and we could keep, by 2050, the world's population down to 8 billion. But what is more likely is that we will fail through inertia and inactivity. And by 2050, we'll be up to 10.5 billion. Stop the world. I want to get off. <laughs> that is unsustainable. So what are we going to do about it? Most of the growth, 95% of this growth that we're talking about, is going to occur in the developing countries of the world, 95% of it, and much of it in southern Africa. I've lived in Uganda, in Kenya, in Gabon, in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa. As Darwin taught me, I'm an African. I have a black heart. I came from Africa, as did everyone in this room. Africa is our motherland. It needs our help now, desperately. Let me give you one little tragic story which will stick in your mind. Uganda where I spent six months in a mud hut. An amazing time. Poor little Uganda, its population will increase by over 150% between now and 2050. It is already out of control. The northern part of Uganda, where it abuts onto the Sudan, is ruled by the Lord's Army, this rebel group who recruit young boys, young teenagers, give them revolvers, and tell them to go into any village they like, rape every woman they can see, regardless of her age, and after the rape, put the pistol in the vagina and pull the trigger. Can you imagine that? It haunts me. 
These are United Nations data, lest you think I'm making it up. Wow, awful. So what are we going to do about it? If 95% of this growth is occurring in the developing world, South Africa, South America, Southeast Asia, and um, India, Pakistan, very high on the list. What can we do to help? Well, I think we can help by handing over to women. We've never done this before. When I was in Edinburgh, I had the pleasure of getting to know uh, Sir Dougald Baird, the professor of obstetrics in Aberdeen. And in 1965, he wrote an amazing paper, which I heard him deliver, called A Fifth Freedom. And he said, Roosevelt delineated the four great freedoms, freedom of religion, freedom of opinion, freedom from hunger, freedom from want. But the women of the world deserve a fifth freedom. Freedom from the tyranny of unwanted fertility. <laughs> if we could give women that freedom, human population growth would stop overnight Throughout the developing countries where population growth is highest, only 24% of women have access to any form of contraception. If we could persuade the International Monetary Fund and the World Health Organization, the World Bank, to, for a pittance, make the oral contraceptive pill available to any woman that wanted it, then population growth would shudder to a halt because women's common sense would rule. I like to say, we've discovered a pill that will stop global warming. The oral contraceptive pill if women used it, human population would come tumbling down and we would no longer have a problem of too many people. Let me end with something that happened to me just the other day, three weeks ago, which has changed my thinking. At the last minute, I was asked to go and meet a visiting Kenyan lady, uh, I was in Melbourne, uh, for coffee. Uh, I said, well, all right. I didn't realize who it was going to be. Professor Martai, Kenya's Nobel Peace Prize winner of 2004. What a woman, fantastic. Professor Matai got the Nobel Peace Prize for getting rural women in Kenya to plant 30 million trees. 30 million trees. Wow, my heart applauds what she achieved. And I said to her, Professor Matai, you've taught me something wonderful. There is a new truth and a new inspiration for me behind that age-old phrase, which is at least 2,000 years old. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> if we could replant the world's forests, we would do something immediately that would uh, help to redress excessive population growth. Henry VIII, was the last person 
to plant a new forest in Britain. Let's have another one. Thank you.